This was a brutal conflict in which these young men who were trying to do their best uh, were pitched into an absolute maelstrom of horror and how they got through it. Uh, and one of the key ways they got through it, which is apropos of the term devil dogs and really the reason I followed just a single company is because of this fellow brotherhood, this unit brotherhood that they felt that allowed them to get through it. Sledge is really interesting about this. He talks about the love they had for each other, which was as strong as it would be if it was your own family. And it was that sort of togetherness that got them through it. An excerpt from today's guest who's written a harrowing account of a U.S. Marine unit in the Pacific who were the original Band of Brothers. You can also watch a video podcast excerpt from this episode on our YouTube channel. British author and historian Saul David is here, and I'll speak with him right after this break. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spear. Welcome back. Today's guest is a British academic military historian and broadcaster. He is best known for his work on the Indian Rebellion of 1857 and the Anglo-Zulu War, as well as for presenting and appearing in documentaries on British television. His book is called Devil Dogs, King Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, From Guadalcanal to the Shores of Japan. And author Saul David joins us now. Welcome to the show, sir. Very nice to be here. Thank you. It's very interesting. Uh, I don't know if they have it in England, but... There used to be a, a a treat called devil dogs when I was a kid, which <laughs> which have nothing to do with the Marines. But I want to clarify for folks, um, if you could give them the history of that name as attached to the Marines, and uh, what patch are they, what French patch are they allowed to wear on their left shoulder of their uniforms? Well, both of the, both, the answer to both of those questions goes back to the First World War. The 5th Marine Regiment was uh, raised in 1917. And a year later, it's fighting on the front line in France against the Germans. Now, uh, so the story goes, it certainly appeared in, Amer- in the American press that the Germans were so impressed with the performance of the 5th and 6th Regiment of Marines uh, during the Battle of Belleau Wood uh, that they designated them the devil dogs, the Teufel Hunden, as, uh, uh, as it would be in German. But actually, uh, when I was looking into this, I couldn't find any documentary evidence for that name. I don't really think it matters, to be honest, Robert, because the name certainly stuck. Uh, the uh, soldiers to this day, uh, members of the 5th Regiment, still refer to themselves as devil dogs and are very proud to do so. And what is not in doubt is that the Germans found them a very formidable foe, which comes on to the answer of your second question, which is that the French were pretty impressed by the way the Americans were fighting on their same side during the First World War, that they accorded mm. them this special honour of wearing what's called the fourragère, which is effectively a kind of braided cord you would wear on your left shoulder. Uh, and this is, a, a, in effect, a, a, a unit citation and was awarded specifically uh, to the Devil Dogs for winning the equivalent of five Croix de Guerre, which is the French Gallantry Award. So it's a pretty special award uh, and it's still worn to this day. Have you seen pictures of uh, current Marines wearing this um this cord they still wear it today it's not uh of course worn on the standard uniforms but it is worn on the dress uniforms uh which are, uh, of course where it looks pretty special uh uh it's interesting i've just written a book about paratroopers in the second world war british paratroopers and they had something similar it wasn't a fourager but it was a a braided cord that they wore through their soldiers so i think um you know for elite units this became something quite special that would set them out from the crowd I know Marines like to be set out from the crowd. (laughs) Now, in your research and in the notes on the book, you discovered that there were a number of talented writers in 3rd Battalion. And how was this as a a researcher and historian to work with the first-hand accounts that were so well written. Well, it was absolute gold dust. I mean, uh, one man is chiefly responsible, of course, and that's Eugene uh, B. Bondurant Sledge, uh, who's written arguably the best uh, enlisted man's account uh, of war in the Pacific from the ground level. Uh, And that book, of course, was called With the Old Breed. It's still in print today. I dread to think Mm. how many copies it's sold. It's a really wonderful book. And what's particularly special about it is the... uh, 
way he writes in such beautiful, uh, articulate and thoughtful prose the reality of of life as an ordinary marine fighting in the pacific he doesn't pull any punches uh, when he comes across an officer he's not impressed with or when his fellow soldiers do things he doesn't approve of he puts it down uh, but he also tries to explain so you very much get a sense of this was a brutal conflict in which these young men who were trying to do their best uh, were pitched into an absolute maelstrom of horror and how they got through it. Uh, and one of the key ways they got through it, which is apropos of the term devil dogs and really the reason I followed just a single company is because of this fellow brotherhood, this unit brotherhood that they felt that allowed them to get through it. And and uh, Sledge is really interesting about this. He talks about the love they had for each other, which was as strong as it would be if it was your own family. And it was that sort of togetherness that got them through it. Um, Sledge is the first key uh, character, as I say, but there were many others, uh, four or five other key people. And really striking Robert, that all of them were enlisted men. Normally, in my studies as a military historian, writing about the British Army and the American Army over many centuries, you tend to find that the best written accounts are written by officers because they tended to be the most educated. But in this particular right. case with K Company, the five best accounts are all written by enlisted men. And uh, although Sledge came from a middle-class family, I think you'd call it, his, his father was a physician, a doctor, the other four all came from proper blue-collar working-class backgrounds, which makes their accounts even more remarkable. And Sledge's book obviously was the basis for the miniseries, The Pacific, which was the follow-up to Band of Brothers, obviously. I know that didn't do as well as Band of Brothers. Um, I'm not sure why that is. I've talked to uh, uh, Dale Dye about this a couple of times on that. But, um, that, you know, incredible book. And in these accounts, either one of Sledge's or, or the other men you found, was there a passage that struck you or stood out as unforgettable? There were many, to be truthful, but mm. I, I will just uh, read out, if you don't mind, a, a clip from sure. one of them. Uh, so to set the scene, we're now in the fourth of the four campaigns fought by the 1st Marine Division and K Company in particular. Uh, this is Okinawa. It, it, it is, of course, going to be the last big campaign of the Second World War, although the participants didn't know it at the time. Uh, and it turned into an absolute meat grinder. And the description by Eugene Sledge of the conditions uh, in a place called Half Moon Hill, uh, otherwise known as Maggot Ridge, which the Marines uh, dubbed it after their experience there, uh, is really mm. quite shocking. So I'll just read you the description sure. as he approaches uh, this new position. It was the most ghastly corner of hell I had ever witnessed. As far as I could see, an area that previously had been a low grassy valley with a picturesque stream meandering through it was a muddy, repulsive, open sore on the land. The place was choked with putrefaction of death, decay and destruction. In a shallow defilade to his right lay the corpses of 20 more marines, each on a stretcher and covered with a poncho. Other bodies lay in shell craters, half submerged in muck and water, rusting weapons still in hand. Swarms of flies hovered around them. A sledge goes on to say, for several feet around every corpse, maggots crawled about in the muck and then were washed away by the runoff of the rain. There wasn't a tree or bush left. All was open country. Shells had torn up the turf so completely that ground cover was non-existent. The rain poured down on us as evening approached. The scene was nothing but mud, shell fire, flooded craters with their silent, pathetic, rotting occupants, knocked out tanks and Amtraks and discarded equipment. Utter desolation. Unbelievable. Powerful. To be in that, was that written at the time or was that post-war? Well, it's interesting that Sledge took contemporaneous notes uh, in contravention of all regulations. I mean, you weren't allowed to keep diaries on active service for obvious reasons, Robert. Um, but he did take many notes. I doubt he wrote out that whole passage, but he made enough notes. I've seen them in the uh, in the Sledge archives in Auburn University in Alabama uh, that he was able to kind of flesh them out later on uh, to remind him, of course, as an aide memoir, but also to you know give him some of the actual 
descriptions of, of the experiences uh, he underwent. And then from probably 1950 to 1970, the book was published in the end of the 70s, I think early 80s, uh, he began to write it up. And and he actually said uh, years later in various letters that, again, I've used in the book to kind of finish off the story, what a therapeutic exercise it was for him to relive all of that you might have thought it would be very traumatic for him but actually he he felt it was a way of coming to terms with it and that was the first thing that helped him get over what was quite clearly some severe ptsd uh you know he had survivor syndrome interestingly of the k company veterans he was one of the very very few never to be wounded in action uh let alone killed and of course many of them were so he felt survivor's guilt i think and and the writing of this book enabled him to somehow work it through his system but he also started going to some of the veterans associations and meeting up with the guys that he hadn't seen uh, for many years and he found this tremendously uh uh, uh healing process as well to be able yeah. to talk through with these guys so i think we learn from all of this that you know some form of decompression which i know that the u.s army and the u.s marines do much better today than they ever did in the second world war is absolutely vital rather than pitching these guys from these horrific experiences straight back into civilian life i hope you're enjoying this episode next time author brian walter will be here to talk about his book blue water war maritime struggle in the mediterranean and middle east 1940 to 1945. The British are not in a good position uh, because they've gone from a situation where they were part of a coalition confronting a single adversary to now uh, they're essentially fighting by themselves with no European allies and they're uh, engaged against two different uh, powerful adversaries, one in Northwest Europe and the Atlantic and the other one in the Mediterranean, which means the British are going to have to fight a two-front war assuming they want to, want to uh, continue this contest. Another program you won't want to miss. And if you're enjoying this World War II episode, check out our earlier program about Ronald Spears and his band of brothers with author Jared Frederick. One of the the core elements of the book is his written correspondence with Dick Winters because that truly gave us an insider perspective, uh, perspectives in which they were very candid with each other about what they did and what they did not do during the Second World War. Uh, And so that was one of the really fascinating things is that you you saw these older men coming to terms with their celebrity, celebrity that they were sometimes uncomfortable with. You'll find the link to that show in this episode's description. Take us back to their early days when they first embarked in 1942 and engaged in, in the harsh fighting in the Pacific. Was it a situation where, obviously the Japanese were ferocious fighters, was it a situation where they didn't know what hit them, or that they had they were knocked off their feet and had to, <laughs> had to uh, say this is a different kind of war we're fighting here? For sure. I mean, uh, the reputation of the Japanese before the Guadalcanal campaign, which uh, began in August 1942 and was the first a U.S. ground offensive of the whole Second World War, either in Europe or the Pacific, uh, was, of course, the first chance to strike back against the Japanese, really, in effect, on the ground since Pearl Harbor. Uh, And there had been an unbroken run of success for the Japanese in uh, ground fighting since that point. So there was very much a feeling among the U.S. Marines that, you know, were these supermen? Could we actually take them on? And the initial landing on Guadalcanal on the 7th of August, 1942, we've just gone past the 80th anniversary uh, a few weeks ago, uh, was a bit of a shock in the sense that it wasn't opposed. And they thought, oh, actually, maybe this isn't going to be so tough. But uh, they definitely caught the Japanese on the hop. They did take them by surprise. And there weren't a huge number of Japanese Mm. on Guadalcanal when they initially landed. And if you think of the first US Marine Division being about 19,000 strong, and there are only four or 5,000 Japanese on the island. So you think, okay, this is going to be reasonably straightforward. The reason it wasn't, uh, two factors. One, the US Navy suffers a pretty catastrophic defeat just a few days after the landings and then withdraws its warships and its supply ships, effectively marooning the 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal. Uh, Secondly, the Japanese pour in a lot of reinforcements. It's really a race to reinforce those two forces and to supply them. And thirdly, uh, the US Marines have to put up with uh, unbelievably inhospitable terrain. I mean, this is uh, jungle warfare, uh, a lot of rain, uh, very tough conditions, either hot or very wet. Uh, People got terribly sick with 
dysentery, uh, malaria, uh, and, and of course a lack of supplies until the, uh, the US Navy could finally get back there and start resupplying them. So a lot of guys were terribly malnourished. And when you see K Company coming out at the end of the campaign, a lot of the guys are th- have lost a third of their body weight, which is a you know pretty striking amount. Wow. And it took a long time for them to recover both you know mentally uh, and also physically. Amazing. Now you compare uh, in some of the notes uh, on the, on the book, you compare King Company to Easy Company and the Band of Brothers. Why would you say that is? Well, I, I, what, what I think the, the comparison I was trying to make is that w- one of the ways you can uh, identify or, or sort of unearth the intimacy of war is by following a small group of men. Um, now, Stephen Ambrose yeah. showed that probably the most effective way to do that was to follow a company. And of course, he followed a company of paratroopers. But I felt, and apropos your point about uh, the Pacific uh, miniseries, that there wasn't a book that had done something similar for uh, the Pacific War. You mentioned Sledge's book. Well, of course, that was a book written by one man, his own personal perspective. And it only covered the last two campaigns because those are the only campaigns Sledge fought in. And they were, of course, Peleliu, which was a pretty grim experience too, and Okinawa. But the uh, 1st Marine Division story began uh, in Guadalcanal, went on to Cape Gloucester, and then those other two campaigns. And so it was a chance to tell the whole story from start to finish of the US Marines in the Second World War, but also at this intimate level. So that was really the comparison. Band of Brothers uh, showed me how effective it was and how moving it was to follow a small group. And of course, not all of them, uh, Robert, are going to survive. Uh, it's interesting, right. uh, the, 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 uh, the principle of of uh, overseas combat in the Second World War for American troops was that you would generally fight two campaigns and or two years. Very few fought, were supposed to fight in three campaigns, but by the time you get to the end of Cape Gloucester, in, in the case of K Company, they asked a lot of the guys who'd already fought in the first two campaigns to stay on. And so people like uh, Akak, Haldane, who's this, uh, also features in the Pacific, this wonderfully kind of a sensitive but effective officer who was much loved by all the men of K Company, goes on to fight in one more campaign. And of course, anyone who's seen the Pacific will know, uh, you know, the terribly sad way that story ends. And so it was a chance to piece together the whole story. And as um, uh, Eugene Sledge's son, Henry, writes in the foreword to the book, uh, I filled in for him the missing bit of the story of K Company. Of course, he knows uh, his dad's experience. So really, that was the point, to try and tell the coherent story of the uh, Pacific War through the eyes of a single company of US Marines. What is the reaction of his son, Ben, to the book? What does he... Well, I was naturally quite concerned that, and not just... uh, I I didn't just get in touch with uh, the sledges. I also got in touch with the relatives of uh, Andy Haldane, who I've just mentioned, and a couple of the other key people in the story, um, Thurman Miller, otherwise known as T.I. Miller, who was there from the start in Guadalcanal. He fought in the first two campaigns and, uh, again, wrote one of those five uh, wonderful books I mentioned at the start of our conversation. And in every single case... And I didn't pull any punches. I sent the whole manuscript and I said... you know, be completely honest with me what you feel. Do you think I've, 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 uh, I've been true to the memory of these people? That was obviously the intention. It's the intention of any professional historian, I, I would hope, to, to try and, uh, yeah. you know, retell in as, in as accurate a way as you can, in as sensitive way as you can, someone else's story. I wasn't there. Uh, and, uh, well, certainly in the case of Henry and the others, they were uh, very pleased with the book and they have all either endorsed it or have provided assistance that is in effect an, an endorsement pictures and, and other things so the response from the families has been wonderful and and in a way of course they have already had a certain amount of attention because of the pacific uh, but their kind of sense of having the whole story told i think is really palpable and I hope this book is emblematic, not just, of course, for K Company and, and the descendants of, of its soldiers, but also the whole experience of, of, of the US military in the Pacific more generally. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you about to close with. What do you want the audience, what do you want to leave our audience with about these warriors? Well, I think there are some current resonances. I mean, we're always asked this as historians, you know, what is the relevance of your writing history to what's going on today? And I think we can see in the war in Ukraine a a 
a, a country, a people, civilians who are now soldiers. I interviewed a guy a couple of days ago for a podcast that I'm doing over in the UK uh, who was a PhD environmental scientist before the war, and he's now fighting on the front line uh, as a colonel in charge of an absolutely vital uh, control and communications unit. And and so what's important about this story in the Second World War is these are ordinary guys, uh, very few of them professional soldiers who appear in the book, who were asked to do something extraordinary for their country, for the liberty of their country, and, and frankly, the liberty of the Western world. Uh, that's not to say that that was their fundamental driving motive, but it is to say after the event, uh, they are very proud of the part they played. It was a, you know, a huge cast of characters, millions of people doing the same thing. But the part they played uh, in ultimately ensuring the freedom of their country and the, and the rule of law and democracy. And those are exactly the same things that the colonel was saying to me just a couple of days ago when I asked him what his motivation to fight for his country was now. And so... I would like people to uh, uh, read the story of the Second World War in its own terms, uh, but also to see yeah. that occasionally people need to make these types of sacrifices. The book is called Devil Dogs, King Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, from Guadalcanal to the shores of Japan. Saul, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks so much, Robert. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for joining me. You can also watch a video podcast excerpt from this episode on our YouTube channel. Next time, author Brian Walter will be here to talk about his book, Blue Water War, Maritime Struggle in the Mediterranean and Middle East, 1940 to 1945. The British are not in a good position uh, because they've gone from a situation where they were part of a coalition confronting a single adversary to now uh, they're essentially fighting by themselves with no European allies and they're uh, engaged against two different uh, powerful adversaries, one in Northwest Europe in the Atlantic and the other one in the Mediterranean, which means the British are going to have to fight a two-front war assuming they want to, want to uh, continue this contest. Another program you won't want to miss. And if you like what you hear, leave a review or a rating or just click the follow button. And be sure to check out our Point of the Spear YouTube channel with bonus video material plus full military history documentaries. There's tons to explore, and I hope you check it out. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from Audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.